Are you saying that your intention is to just say, screw you, we're not going to comply? Hey, if you need to go ahead and sue us, that's that's okay. It's not a battle they're going to win, and we're not going to back down because at the end of the day, we have logic and facts behind us. Today's video is sponsored by Native Sons Goods, makers of the best woven guitar, bag, and camera straps on planet Earth. And now the best is even better with a new line of hand-woven Maya Serape straps with USA Organic Herringbone Hemp backing. Get 10% off when you use the link in the description, and remember when you support my sponsor, you support this channel, and I sure appreciate it. Hello everybody, Brad the Guitologist here. Welcome back to the channel. As most of you guys know who have followed this channel and have followed online news for a little while in the guitar world, you'll know that Gibson Guitars has had its fair share of problems over the last couple of years. First, of course, they went bankrupt, as everybody I'm sure knows. Uh, then they had a series of issues. They've had leaked videos crushing hundreds of guitars under end loaders they've had the problem of the mark agnesi's now infamous play authentic video to the manufacturers out there we want you to know that you've been warned we're looking out to all the people in the film and television and commercial industry stop taping over the logos on the headstock be original play authentic they have actually sued Dean Guitars for their version of the Flying V. They've sued people in Europe and lost the cases in Europe. You know, it just seems to be one thing after another. At one point, uh, Gibson actually started a program where they were going to license Gibson shapes to some companies, including Echo Park Guitars, which is a deal that has since fallen through. I have been in contact with the owner of Echo Park Guitars, Gabriel, and I've spoken to him several times. He doesn't want to come on officially because you know there of course there are some legal issues that are still kind of outstanding and he didn't want to kind of go on the record about some things but uh, maybe one of these days we'll get Gabriel on here to explain what all happened with that but suffice it to say Gibson has had its share of bumps uh, in the road over the last couple of years and uh, the internet has been quick to pounce this is just yet another example uh, here this past week Gibson has sent a cease and desist letter now to Kiesel Guitars. So this is the body shape, an unequal length V guitar, right? Mm -hmm. That's right. So very unique. Well, the good folks at Gibson decided to send us a cease and desist letter on a guitar my dad designed in the mid 80s. It would be like if somebody said this Ultra V and the Gibson V look the same, that would be like saying a Porsche looks like a Ferrari. I named the Ultra V. So I think it was about 86 when it came out. I was seven years old. So it's like a really special model to me. And for, to have those bozos um, try to tell us we can't make it anymore when it looks literally nothing like it. I mean, come on, guys. I mean, look at the pointed body. Look at the bevel on it. I mean, does that look anything like their V. Kiesel Guitars, of course, based out of California, formerly Carvin Guitars. Uh, they still have the exclusive rights to uh, make guitars under the Carvin name also, and they do uh, issue a couple of Carvin guitars still. But this past week, Jeff Kiesel, the owner of Kiesel Guitars, went to Instagram with a cease and desist letter, and uh, I reached out to Jeff, had a very long discussion with him about all things Gibson, uh, about the history of carving guitars, about the guitar market in general. I thought you guys would enjoy, so check this out. Thanks for calling Kiesel Custom Guitars. To speak with one of our guitar experts, press one. Hello, this is Jeff. Hello, Jeff. Hey, this is Brad, the guitologist, man. How you doing? Hey, what's up, dude? How are you? I'm, I'm doing pretty well, man. Yeah, listen, uh, I saw the Instagram video you put up, I guess it was, I don't know, a couple days ago. And uh, yeah, just a really curious thing. Uh, what what do you think is going on in Gibson's mind, dude? What what's uh, what are they are they they're coming after the Ultra V? Is that the only model that they're that they're coming after on the cease and desist that you just received? No, they're coming after two of our models. Um, and one is the Ultra V, um, and I'll talk about that real quick. That way we kind of keep both guitars separate. Sure. Um, so the so the Ultra V uh, came out in 1986. 
And what a lot of people probably don't know, um, but it's public knowledge, is Gibson's trademark for their V was approved in 1995. So here I got a model that came out in 86, or my dad came out with, I really should say, but the company came out with in 86. I was only seven years old. Um, but, um, you know, we've been selling it ever since. You know, it's not changed or anything. And so it's pretty, uh, guy, what is, the, what is the word I want to use here? I mean, what a lack of research on their part just to go ahead and send a letter um, you know, with no kind of context to fall back on. And it, it's pretty sad. Um, you know, obviously they're, they've got to be going through some financial struggles for them to be wasting time on something like this. You know, this is just a, a chase that will end, you know, and they're, they're ultimately losing. I think what they're after is companies to go, oh, almighty Gibson, we're sorry, we'll stop making it. But when you look at the facts, number one, we've been making it before their trademark was approved. So even yeah. if it was a direct copy, there's nothing they could do, which it's, it's not a direct copy. I mean, it's not it even looks close. Nothing. It's not even close. So you look at that and you go, okay, we've been making it since 86. Their patent nine years later gets approved, or not patent, trademark, uh, nine years later, and it's a dotted line patent. The patent is is not very enforceable um, the way they've done it, um, you know, or trademark. Excuse me, I keep saying patent uh, because a patent is actually how you really enforce something is with the design patent, and that's what we have um, on my my newer models. Um, you know, we've done design patent work on. And that's when you can really go after somebody. Um, and a design patent's only good for 15 years. So what you do is you follow that up with a trademark application if you want to ensure the life of that particular model stays protected. Um, so they're really going down this road that they don't have any leg to stand on. They're just throwing these letters out to a lot of people. It's not just mm -hmm. me. I don't feel special here. Um, and... I don't quite understand their stance because I know they sent out a bunch of letters. It was a really bad look. They realized it was a really bad look, and they apologized. Right. And then this is a second wave of another really bad look for them. And to send it to a company like us, it really shows you that they don't know what they're doing. And, and what I mean by that is, they don't know our internet presence. They don't know our fan engagement. They don't obviously know my personality where I'm going to let everybody know. So if there was any kind of logic used in any kind of research, there's no way in hell they would have ever sent that letter knowing the dates, number one, that nine years prior we were making the model, and uh, number two, it looks nothing like it. So the Ultra V was, it's like, really, guys, are you really that dense you know come on yeah so it shows you the people making decisions it's a corporation that doesn't know the guitar business right, right. and uh that's typically what happens right and that's what i try to remind customers of is over the years these companies the big boys fender and gibson they've been sold they've gone out of business and they've had corporations take them over and and they've been ran at different capacities and by different people over the years where our company has, has been us the whole time, right? My grandfather, then my dad, and, and now me and my dad. And I have to commend you, dude. Um, what you've managed to do with Kiesel as a brand, uh, just in the limited amount of time that you've been doing this, uh, you're recognized by everybody who goes on the Internet. So, I mean, it's it's amazing what you've been able to achieve. And I think you definitely proved the naysayers wrong uh, I don't know what uh, what Gibson's thinking, man. Other than maybe they're trying to establish some kind of legal standing where they can they can get a few of these people to kind of, like you said, capitulate and throw up their hands and say, "Oh yeah," and bow down to Gibson's demands. And then they'll, you know, if they do any future uh, lawsuits, they'll have a little bit of better standing because then they they will have all these companies a list of companies that. Uh, you know, stop producing whatever it is they told them to produce because, oh, because see here, Judge, you know, these guys agreed that Gibson's yeah. uh, authority was sacrosanct, you know, so uh, I think that's probably what they're going for, but that's what I think, I think you hit on it, man. That's what happens when you got 
a bunch of people running a company that's a guitar company and it's you know it's based on selling stuff to artists but you've got a bunch of people who have sold jeans in the past yep. and 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 our right. and our PR people you know when i talk to people it's when we're selling guitars it's like selling sports cars it's like selling dessert you know you're not selling milk you know which is jeans and clothes and and uh, necessities, right? Toothpaste, things like that. Right. Um, people need, but you don't need another guitar. And you know, when you act in a in a capacity that is very, um, I guess you, you're really pushy and you're assuming a lot of things. Um, you know, they don't. People don't need Gibson. They really, really, really don't. I mean, you can get. And I'm not saying anything about their product. You know, I have always been a fan of the Les Paul. I do like that guitar a lot. I don't like their quality of finishes. I don't like the construction necessarily, but I like the Les Paul shape. I have our California single cut tattooed on my forearm, which brings me to our second guitar they send us a letter about was our CS6, our California single cut. Right. And what happened with that guitar we launched that guitar after PRS won the lawsuit against Gibson. So here, Gibson goes after PRS in 2005. Gibson loses the lawsuit to PRS Correct. for the you know the PRS single, mm-hmm. and it set a precedent in my mind and for everybody else in the guitar industry that hey, it's okay to make this guitar. Sure, because PRS won. And we launched ours after PRS won. And our guitar is not like a PRS, it's not like a Gibson. So when you look at it from that standpoint, it's also, here's a history you have. You went after a company and you lost. How are you gonna come after me? Right. So we launched that guitar in 2006, again, after PRS won. And we've been making it since 2006. Here's a guitar we've been making 14 years and you're gonna knock on my door now and this is a battle you've already lost. So are these people reading this? Are they researching it? Do they Are they paying attention? They're not addressing it in their letter to me. They're not saying, hey, we know we lost this against PRS, but due to new evidence, you know, this, is, this is our standpoint. But there's nothing in there. It's just a generic letter that they probably spent $500 sending out, and now I had to lawyer up, of course, and I had to give a retainer, mm-hmm. um, and I have to waste my time with. I, and know? I think and, you know, part of me, a part of me believes that that could be what's going on. They 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 feel like, oh, we have this team of lawyers that we have to pay for. Let's make everybody else pay for lawyers now. You know, let's let's and make everybody right. Yeah, let's make our competition uh, have to be out all this money so they can't pour that into research and development and can't beat us further. But you know, we kind of. Screw them, <laughs> in, a, in a way. They, they could, like you well, said, he, they can never win it. I don't think there's a possible case. So, and, and let me ask you no. this real quick, Jeff. Are are you are you saying that your intention is to just, just say screw you? We're not going to comply. Oh, absolutely. I mean, we have okay. to give a letter back to them, but we're going to, you know, we'll, we'll let them know that. Hey, if you need to go ahead and sue us, that's that's okay. Right. You know, it's not a battle they're going to win, and we're not going to back down because. At the end of the day, we have logic and facts behind us. They have nothing. They just have pure emotion. Hey, um, we hear in the industry you're making a better single cut than we are. Mm-hmm. And, and that's not going to be the case for everybody. Some people want that lacquer finish. They want that finish that's going to wear off. I get it. Some people want that shorter scale. So I can't say our guitar in everybody's mind is better that's not what I. That's not what I'm saying at all. What I can say is we're using genuine Honduran mahogany. We're building it here in America. We're putting a higher gloss, better looking finish in terms of fit and finish. Our guitars are more playable as far as easier access, and then you can customize them on top of that. So, when you look at it from this standpoint, you go, okay, Gibson, let's throw some robot tuners on again. And, you know, that was a total disaster. <laughs> but if they didn't have other companies building the single-cut style guitar, you'd be forced to go to them. Yeah. So they could weather a storm like that. But when they have a 
big, huge blunder with hundreds of thousands of guitars going out with these tuners that don't work. You can't even sell, you can't even tune them yourself. How does that happen? Yeah. How do you get to that point as a company if musicians are running it? And, and you the know, answer is they're not. Right, right. And you know what's amazing to me uh, has been just the kind of uh, the two-faced aspect of the way they've approached all this. You know, they they said, yeah. "Oh, we're ju- we're going to be friends with everybody," and then they come out with that uh, that that stupid video, and then they're like, "Oh, we're sorry for that video," and now they're back to this again. So it's like, yeah. you know, who's calling the shots over there? Is it is it actually Curly or is it somebody at uh, KKR calling the shots? Yeah, I don't know. I don't know what they're they're thought process is, but I wish they would have, before they start doing this type of stuff, you'd think they would have done their research. Research, And they could have looked and said, okay, well, Keith will actually beat us to when our trademark actually came out. So a company like that, we probably better leave alone. They're making a single cut that is, you know, it's got a lot of a similarity to a PRS. It's still our own, but it's, it's more similar to a PRS than it is a, a Les Paul. And we lost that battle. So at that point, we better go ahead and, and take a back seat, especially when you look at our fan engagement. You know, we don't have as many followers as they do, but when we go live, we have thousands of people watching, and within a couple of days, our videos get 100,000 views when we go live. Well, there's, and, there's don't. There's do they have to oh, go? No, there's don't. There's don't. Yeah. They have to go. Uh, you know, to some hot shots. Uh, you know, private stash to get that many hits on on a video. They don't. Sure. They don't get that many hits. I've been watching their no, channel, I man. Know. They don't. They they have no uh, savvy when it comes to online presence. I think that's why they hired Mark. And Mark, frankly, I mean, granted, it wasn't all his fault, but he's dropped the ball big time with that video he made, and. Uh, yeah, you know, it's just they blew it. They basically shot themselves right in the foot. I, I, I think at this point, I, my only theory, man, is that they're trying to throw their weight around and hope that they they cost somebody so much money that they end up going out of business. Like they almost drove Paul Reed Smith out of business, from what I hear. You know that he was he was basically you know uh, he was getting down you know to his kind of the end of his bank account too a little bit by the time I think all that was over in legal fees. So. Maybe that's what they're thinking, man. That they could try to do this to you, and I hope I just hope that the guitar community rallies around you and doesn't let that happen. Yeah, and it, it's a sad thing. I mean, you know, I don't. Again, I don't know how far they're going to push this, but you know, it, it's not something that we're feeling like we should ever have to back down from. Um, yeah. And I haven't heard from my attorney in a couple of days. You know, he just laughed at the whole thing, and I. I told him, I said, look, you know, I'm going to go live. I'm going to tell the fans about this. I'm going to make a new model right in front of their eyes, a headless version of my Ultra V. And I'm going to put it for sale. I'm also going to mark down my Ultra V, which is the model they're uh, pissed off about. I'm going to mark down my single cut so that people that want to support us, I'm going to go ahead and discount it a little bit to help them support us. And my lawyer thought it was a great idea. Yeah, you know, it is. he's that comfortable about our stance um, that he was okay with me, you know, quote unquote, poking the bear. Right. Um, you know, based on, you know, you just look at facts, right? And that's that's what um, you know a judge is going to do if it if it does go there. I, I, you know, I don't know how it could go there, uh, but you never know. You know, everybody's got their their right to a day in court within a certain uh, point of view um, but I, I don't think it's going to go that far and of course we're going to keep the public apprised the whole way through yeah yeah it's I mean it's it's so weird that you know they're trying this stuff with with Dean um, and Dean's obviously you know they're doing more or less a direct copy of a V uh, a Gibson style, oh, yeah. a style V but they've been doing it for so long there's no way they're going to win that one either and they've already lost that in, in Europe the the one that they had there so it's like dude you know when are they going to stop trying to do the same thing again and again expecting a different result you know because that's like the definition of insanity <laughs> you know that's right uh, well, and it's it's too it's this is i've always told people this and i i really believe in this only you can only worry about yourself you can't right. worry about what somebody else is doing and if you focus on yourself 
you're going to get the results you want. But when you're worried about somebody else, that's typically like a last ditched effort. And you're usually on your way out at that point. I've seen people that way in this industry where it's at different capacities where they're worrying about somebody and why they're so successful and they end up ultimately driving themselves into the ground because they're focused on that person. I think a lot of our success is the transparency, you know, the going live, the walking through the shop. We do a live Q&A every Wednesday and we let our customers come on and ask us anything. I'm only here because of them. Right. And I think a lot of people forget that key thing that we have to be thankful for our fans whether they're customers or they're just supporters whether they actually buy or they're just preaching the good word because without them we're not here i don't get to do what i want and what i love and then i'm working for somebody else i spoke to gabriel at echo park guitars they were one of the first uh ones that gibson was trying to license their designs to remember that I, I, I'm kind of in my own bubble. You're in your um, okay. Well, if you if you look yeah, this, I don't I don't get on the internet much. Well, there was a news story about uh, Gibson. They were going to try to start licensing their stuff, so it was like basically Gibson authorized guitars. So oh. they were going to let okay. these other companies, and this is their other way that they're going about trying to establish some kind of legal standing for uh, trademarks and and such is that they're getting other companies to sign off on these deals to uh, allow them to create guitars in the shapes that they claim they own, like the V and the Explorer and stuff like that, uh, and pay a license fee. And he was one of the first people who was kind of duped into signing on to this because they, what they did was they sent him a cease and desist first because he was making mm -hmm. stuff like Dean was making and everybody else on the Sun's making. Um, and they sent him first a cease and desist, just like they've done with you. And then they came back with their lawyers, and they tried to negotiate him into a contract uh, for a licensing deal. So they would pay, they would, he would pay a licensing fee. So that was one of their tactics with him. And I, I've been meaning to get him on the show, but he's he's got an attorney that is, is advising him to kind of hold off, and uh, you know I don't know what for, but uh, but I just thought I would let you know that just to kind of put under your in your uh -huh. quill. Yeah, I, I didn't even hear about any of that again. It's I'm, you know, we, we kind of joke here, uh, the guys do with me at least, because I am so much in my own bubble. And the big reason for that is I want whatever I'm creating to be as original as possible, um, and I don't want any outside influence. I don't spend time on the Internet. Um, and, you know, unfortunately... You know, you do that, you work real hard, and, um, you know, they say imitation is the sincerest form of flattery. Well, we have a lot of people that have really, you know, copied what we've done, um, you know, in the past several years. And, again, not saying I invented the guitar or anything like that, but we did do some things that were pretty forward-thinking, like the Aries guitar. It has a huge bevel on it. And when I was getting ready to release it, everybody here, Nobody thought the bevel was good. They said, it's too big. You need to make it smaller. It's not going to sell. It's not going to be successful. I just dug in and said, that's how it has to be. And I launched it, and there was 50% hate for that guitar when we launched it. And the guys were like, told you. And Well, you fast forward to today. It's our number one selling guitar. Almost every company in the industry has copied that bevel. Um, and you know, here we are, right? And so that, that does happen. Um, yeah. And so sometimes you got to be forward thinking and at the same time you got to also, you know, take your chances and, and protect things too. And, and we do have um, patents, um, design patents on our models, uh, almost all of them. You know, obviously when we launched our our version of a, of a Strat, it's called the Delos, we didn't design patent that because, well, it's a Strat. I did, however, design patent my headless Delos, so um, which I do have a design patent on that. So if anybody decides they want to make a headless strap style guitar, uh, if it's too close to ours, then we will actually have grounds for a cease and desist because this is not protecting it after the fact. This is doing something, protecting it, and then saying, hey guys, we do have a protection on this. You're gonna need to make a change. And that's not the case with Gibson. So 
I understand where they're at. Unfortunately, they did uh, decided not to protect something for 50 some odd years and then go after it. And that's yeah. not what you do. Yeah. So uh, they got themselves in this pickle. You they know, they and, sure uh, have. I don't know how. I, I, I honestly, I think they've lost so much goodwill in the guitar community, and they just keep losing it. That's the problem. It's like every time you think, okay, well, maybe they're past this and they're going to do better. It's like they just keep, like you know, they'll come out with a with a video bulldozing a three hundred guitars. You know what I mean? So it's like, what? I just don't get it. I don't know what they're thinking. And. Yeah. Uh, you know, especially the cease and desist against you on that guitar. I mean, to be quite honest with you, I'll be straight up with you, man. Grover Jackson has more of a complaint against you than they ever did. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, it's like, uh, sure. it's not, but yours is like completely reversed from his. You know what I mean? I see the difference and I Correct. would never mistake your guitar for a Grover, for a Jackson, you know? So it's like, sure. it's a different freaking guitar, guys. Get over it. You know what I mean? If you don't, if you want to do something, then go back to the drawing board and do something you have, you know, that that's uh, new and that you haven't done since 1960. You know what I mean? That's yeah. the way I see it. Well, and, and two, you don't let somebody manufacture something and get their business going and then say something. Um, you know, that's really, I guess, there's that timeline, right? Um, and that's, I mean, people can claim they didn't know, but obviously. You know, we've been making that Ultra V since, you know, since the mid-80s, 86, and, you know, you can't claim you didn't know for that long. Yeah, um, exactly. So I guess that's kind of where the bigger problem is. I think what they probably did is they probably went, oh, here's this Kiesel company. How old's Kiesel? And they look, and they go, oh, Kiesel's 2015. They go, oh, well, they can't make this. Maybe not knowing we were carving, um, you know, I, I don't know. So, again, still not very logical from that standpoint, but I guess that would be better than the latter, which is knowing that we've been making it for, you know, since, since the 80s. It's, I, I don't know. You're probably right about the licensing thing. I think that that is, you're probably right on the money yeah. with what you said. They're probably hoping for us. Uh, that we would, um, in fact, go ahead and go along with that. Right. The value, That's dude. That's what it is. KKR, man, here's what they do, dude. The value in Gibson is in any patents, any intellectual property they have. That's the value in Gibson, really. Uh, and if they can come in, they figure, if they can come in with their team of lawyers, and if they can push people around in the industry, and they can establish their, uh, their patent superiority, in the industry, that they'll basically double the value of the company overnight, and uh, then they can sell it for sell it off for a huge profit, or they can sell it off piecemeal. Uh, and if they want to sell the patents piecemeal, they could do that. You know what I mean? They have all kinds of options at that point. I think that's what they're doing. Uh, they're basically vulture cap. You know, they're kind of the vulture capitalist type. Uh, I don't think they give a damn about guitars. They don't care about making guitars. They're just coming in, trying to establish uh, more value. Um, and that's, that's where they're at right now. Yeah. I mean, that does make sense. I mean, there is a, there's a math formula for American made guitars at least. And typically, um, the company would be worth about eight times the annual profit. That's what American guitar companies are worth. American, not import, you know, that's what they can be worth. I don't know what Gibson's profit is. Right. Yeah. Um, so I don't know what their worth really is from from that standpoint. So you might be totally right. Maybe their profits aren't good, and they're realizing that, and they're trying to go after the uh, the patent um, the patent game. But totally could be accurate. Yeah. I, well, I think it is just based on everything that I've seen. It just seems like it's it's the only explanation that fits the data. You know. So I, I, yeah. I think, man, what you've done with the company is just amazing, uh, Jeff, and. Uh, Man, I'll, I'm going to let you get on to the rest of your day, and I really, really, really appreciate your time, dude. Hey, no problem, man. Thanks for uh, making the time. I know you got a busy schedule yourself, and anybody wants to know more info, call my guys. They're Guitar Nerds, 858-Guitars. Look online. Our website does kind of suck, Kiesel Guitars. Um, it's outdated. It's 90s technology. We focus on our guitars, not necessarily this... Um, you know, you walk into a fast food restaurant, you see the burger up on that 
that screen there and you're like, man, that looks good. You order it and then you get this thing that sucks. We're the opposite. <laughs> our website sucks. You get this thing that's amazing. And at some point, our website will catch up to the quality of guitar we're building today. But we're always, you know, continuing to push the envelope and build a better better product. Yeah, it definitely shows, man. I, I, I appreciate all your time once again. Awesome, brother. Well, you have a good one. All right, you too, Jeff. All right, guys, that will do it for this video. If you want to see the full version of this interview unedited, click the link up above. I will put a link up here in a card so you can go see that. Jeff and I probably talked for about another 40 minutes. We get into a lot of really controversial subjects, the history of carving guitars, so it's definitely worth a click to see the full interview. But for now, y'all take care.